Um, welcome to this short session on Zero MQ in Rust. Um, today we will just have a look at the syntax and uh, a little show a few examples of how to use uh, CMQ with Rust. As you've already worked with this in other languages, I will um, not go into detail into what exactly it is uh, or the purpose of it, since uh, that should have been covered in uh, other languages or in the videos that was posted earlier this week. So instead, we are going to have a look at an example in Rust, so you can get a bit familiar with how to use uh, CMQ with Rust. Uh, so, uh, so the example we will look at first is, say you have some sort of program or like a server that produces uh, work hashes, like for mining cryptocurrencies. For example, you generate uh, some workload unit for Bitcoin, uh, some other uh, currencies, Chile, Doge, um, or some other tasks that require uh, some work on the other end, like folding. And we create a work unit, which has a title, uh, some duration. This is just for example purposes. So this is like how long should the client uh, spend processing this? Uh, obviously this wouldn't be sent if it was real. And then some sort of a reward. So for example, if you figured out some part of a Bitcoin hash and uh, were able to uh, get some coins back, you will get maybe 0 0.000001 in return. It doesn't matter. It's like you get a reward for doing a work unit. So we are going to use first like a push and pull uh, socket from CMQ, where we have where we basically push out workloads and then clients either on like a terminal app, uh, Android app, uh, actually really anything, are going to consume it and you like perform this work unit. So in a way, this could be a real thing, but um, for now, it's just a test. Uh, so what we do is we're going to choose just randomly from one of these preset names as a title. And then we are going to create random work units by just uh, generating a range of any titles, a range of durations from half a second to 1.3 seconds. And we're going to generate a reward from like anywhere from 50 to 500. So in this case, this could mean like uh, Norwegian kroners or uh, dollars or uh, rupees, whatever you want. Or it could be an arbitrary uh, number. So that's like the data we're going to be working with. And we're also going to use, so all of this is in a shared library. So it's under just source lib. So all of this work units we will be able to have access to in both our worker and our server. So when we get started with the server and the worker, which will be both two separate binaries, uh, using what we mentioned in a previous lecture, that you can have multiple binaries in the same uh, in the same package uh, by just putting them in a bin folder. So we can be, we're going to be able to run both the server and the worker from the same project. And they can share the lib, so we don't have to duplicate these data structures. So that's quite useful. So our basic starting point for today is a work unit with some data and a function to generate a new random work unit. Or we can create manual work units with the new function. So let's start with our server first. Uh, but before I forget, let's just go through quickly the dependencies. So we're using CMQ, obviously, since we're going to work with CMQ. Uh, we're going to use Serda for serialization of data structures before we send them over over the sockets. So this uh, and Serda JSON because we're going to use JSON as our format. So this allows us to automatically uh, serialize and deserialize data structures. Uh, and we're going to use the derived macro from Serda, which allows us to automatically create uh, like a JSON serialization, deserialization for various data structures. I will be using log and simple logger as well, just to get some log messages out. So this is different from print line in that you can have different log levels like warning, error, um, you can have info, trace, debug, like all of the usual logging stuff. And you get like timestamps and all of that. So that's uh, useful if you're uh, going to debug or look, have this app run for a long time in the background. So you can see uh, when various events happened. 
You can use any how for any error handling, like we have discussed earlier. And RAND is what we're using for generating the uh, the work units, like here. So that's our dependencies. So, so let's get started with the server. So what we have up front is uh, a couple of imports for from our library and the logger. And we are have just creating a logger here with a filter at the info level. So anything below info should not be visible to the user. And then we use anyhow here in case it, uh, the function fails. And we have added context creating the logger and then we're going to get the good error message. So the first thing you're going to need every time you work with CMQ, especially like uh, with the other libraries, we're going to need a context. So let's start by creating a context. Uh, and with this context, we're going to be able to create sockets and we want to specify socket type. So this is all hidden under the namespace here. So everything is available directly. So we have pull, push, sub, pub, uh, dealer, pair, all of those socket types. So right now we're going to use push and pull. Uh, but we might also go ahead and use the sub and pub after as in, in a second example. Um, however, I think these actually ex exist in socket type as well. Yeah, so if you want to isolate them, they're in here. Uh, the reason you see them in CMQ as well is because uh, they've exposed these enum, enum uh, names into the uh, namespace CMQ and not just underneath uh, the socket type enum. So that's probably for ease of use. So our server, since it's going to be creating workloads and handing them out to others, will be of the type push. And I don't think there are any other arguments to this. No. So let's just set that the socket equals this. And since it's a result, we are going to want to add a context just saying uh, creating sockets and a question mark so it returns if it fails. So now we just get our socket or we close the program with a sensible error message. Cool. Uh, finally, I want to bind the sockets to a port. Um, let's say, I think we can just do this and say 9000. No, we actually have the port here. So let's format this. I think star is fine and it binds to every accessible port. So both the local host and any other hosts that you can access. So if you have a router, like a local network, you get combined to that as well. So, uh, and then we want to add the push port. Like so. And since it wants a string, we want to go as str. Nice, so this can also fail. So let's uh, go with context and just say binding socket and a question mark so that it crashes or it doesn't crash, but it uh, provides a useful error message with the context in case it fails. So then we'll get an error binding socket with some context. Uh, and given that we are we come this far, we can start uh, creating our workloads. So to begin, we want to use our new random function to generate a new work unit. So let's just say that the work unit equals the work units new random, oops, like so. So we have a work unit, a random work unit that we can send off to our clients. And to use our log library, we're actually gonna just say info. So. Let's just log that uh, the server is ready at uh, this this uh, address. Uh, yep, so we have our work units. And just for debug purposes, we can just log that work unit ready. And we're gonna put in our work unit here. So it's gonna complain since we haven't derived it. 
So we want to derive from debug. So that way we can just print a debug message of what work unit we are. Uh, we have prepared. Uh, so now comes the next part where we want to actually send it. So we have socket.send that we can use. It takes some data and some flags. Uh, we're not going to use the flags for this example. Uh, although, yeah. So data is at type T. So we could just try to send a work unit and see what happens. Pretty sure, let's say cargo build. It's not gonna, yeah, so there's no from work unit for the message. So the type it sends is a type message. And since we don't have a way to convert a work unit to a message, uh, we can't just pass the work unit. Also, the work unit is not cloned and it cannot be copied since we have a string, which is our own resource. Uh, so that's where our serialization library comes in, Serde. So we are going to use that to convert our work unit into JSON. And to allow for that, we first have to add our derive to be serialized and deserialize. So if we're just going to serialize, we don't need this one. But since we're also going to write the client, uh, we want to deserialize the data into back into work unit once we get it back. Um, yep. Yeah, so now we're going to have to use that. So I'm going to use if let uh, let's see. I think it's a result that we get. So let's say uh, string. And we're going to say third JSON to string. And we're going to pass in our work unit. And I think that produces a result. Yep. Which is why OK is correct. If it had been like option, then we would have to instead use some. And in the case that that's OK, we want to send our string. So maybe string is a bad name for it. We should call it serialized data or something. Otherwise, we want to just log a, an error maybe saying we could not serialize the work units. And then we can just move on. So. Let's also just have a counter, so uh, uh, work units, zero. So I can just log info, say that uh, sent work units number, work units. And then we are just work units plus equals. Just so we can like have some uh, interactive feedback to a user. Um, or to have whoever runs this server. So I think that's what we're going to need for the server. Yeah. And if we say that we want to run the server, it should now uh, be ready to push that data. But it's not going to push anything until we actually have a worker connect to it. So that's going to be our next step. So for the client, we are now in the worker. Uh, we have mostly the same imports and also a logger for here. So we can actually look this. The start is mostly the same. We will need a context. And we need a socket. And the socket type in this case, since we have a push socket, we're going to need a pull socket to pull some work from the server. And we want to add some context to the error. So that's going to be creating sockets like so. And our return type here is also result. So at the bottom, we're just going to add OK. Because if we get to the bottom, we are good. Uh, and then we want to have the sockets connect to the server instead of binding to a port that you can listen to. So, and that's gonna be, uh, so we're gonna use localhost here. And the port is, so we're gonna use format again. 
and it's the push port. And not this, like so. And we want it as a string. And in the case of failure, we want to say connecting to server. And if we run it now, that should fail. Since there is no actual server. Right, we forgot the question mark here. And it seems like it doesn't fail actually. So that's useful. Maybe it doesn't fail if there's no server. But as it turns out, CMQ also uses the logging library. So we actually get log messages from CMQ here as well. So that's actually very useful. Uh, anyway, uh, let's uh, move on. So we want to, since our work units are producing duration and rewards, as a worker, we want to know like total rewards and total time MS. So we want to know just how, how long did we work, how much did we earn, so we can say uh, this is how much you earn per second or whatever. And then we're back in our loop. So, and given that we get this far, we can just go log info ready to receive at work. Forgot the e. There we go. Okay, well, so here we basically want to do the opposite of what we do in the server. Uh, so the server uses survey to uh, produce data and then send it. So here we want to do the opposite. We want to receive data and then deserialize that into uh, from a string JSON string to a actually strongly typed type. So let's start with data equals socket receive. So receive string is a thing, but it's uh, it's deprecated, I think. Maybe it's not, I uh, know send string is deprecated, but it turns out receive string is not deprecated. So, and since we know we're sending a string, we can actually use this directly. And yeah, and we don't want any flags here. So here we can see there are multiple layers of results. So we probably want to uh, get those. So. If we do unwrap just to see what's the next type, then we see the next one is string and a vec of u8. Uh, probably says what that is. If it's not valid UTF, that is returned as the original vector in the error. Okay, so if it's an invalid string, we just get the, the raw bytes. But if it's valid, then we just then we get a decoded string. We do it first, so decoding a string. Actually, let's see. So since it's a double result, it's gonna be it's a bit interesting how to deal with it uh, in a good way. So maybe if we do if let's. If the initial uh, receive is okay, then we are going to say um, let's ring this uh, serialized string equals data dot I guess we have to do it like this. It's interesting that we can't add a context on this since it is a result type. Uh, I'm a bit unsure why that is, but it could be because the result type actually has string and of x specified and not just the, uh, just the success type. Anyway, we only actually care about the success type. 
So we can just uh, return the result directly if it fails. Or actually we don't want to do that because that's going to break the loop. So maybe if we just add another one in here. And then we can just make it uh, the deserialized data directly. Uh. Yep, and here we can deserialize it. So let's say uh, data equals and this is just using the opposite function, so from string. And the string is the serialized string. And then with context, deserializing data. And then we have to specify the type of the data. So let's say it's a work unit. So if we get a valid work unit, then it should show up in here. So, uh, and then we should be able to work on it. So, and then we should have access to all of this. So we're gonna log and say that, okay, we are working on this, which is the data title and then time spent equals zero and then while time spent is less than the duration we will time spent uh, 10 and then sleep duration from milliseconds and just say 10. And then we can also print the process if progress if we want. Processing and then a percentage. And that's gonna be time spent divided by data duration. And we're going to convert into floats so we get uh, percentage points. And then just multiply by 100. And we use the backslash r so it returns to the start of the line every uh, each time. And then we get, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll see it when we run it. So we should be able to run the worker now. Yep. And then we can split this off. Uh, split right, and then we should be able to run the server. Um, is that, say I have an Android app that uh, uses the same, connects to the same port and understands the same workload format. We can connect with this guy as well and start receiving workloads from the server. At the same time as this worker, this worker gets information, we can also do work on a phone. So now we get this guy, we get a couple other tasks, get a reward. And we just start doing work on a phone. So this can be nice if, for example, like everybody has a phone in their pocket, and if you have like some computations that need to be need to be done, you can have a server push at work and just have like everybody open an app that automatically just receives workloads and just does work while you're not using your phone. Of course, you can automate this. Right now, we have a button to click. It doesn't have to be a phone. It could be your computer at home. It can be like anything. 
And you can at any point just choose to disconnect. And then every other worker is going to take uh, a workload in your place. So uh, it's a quite powerful system. Um, yeah, so uh, so just to pr prove that final point, uh, if we change this to print instead and run a worker, you see that now we actually get the uh, the percentage stays on the same line before it moves on, so we don't we don't get spammed. Um, yeah, so there are other ways to deal with this double result. Uh, if we know that the first one can never fail, we could, for example, just unwrap and go directly here. And we might also want to deal with the error cases there. So we want to say log error and say that. So in the first case, fail to receive data. And in the other case, uh, that would be failed to uh, deserialize data as a string. Failed to interpret data as a string. So if somebody sends a, a not a valid UTF-8 string, then you're going to hit this case. But it's going to keep looping anyway. Um, so that's the basics uh, of a push and pull. Uh, I might post a second video later with a pub sub. Uh, but hopefully this should get you started with using the API in, in Rust. So to summarize, we create a context and a socket. And the socket is any type that's in socket type, any of these. And they have to be paired with their corresponding. So pub and sub go together, push and pull go together, uh, and that, all of that. Um, we bind on a server and connect on a client. And apart from that, it's all about just using send and receive and making sure that uh, you have the, the data format can be interpreted by both parts. So in this case, we use serialize and deselete serialize with the serda and serda JSON libraries to do so. And that allows us to both serialize and read the data and use an intermediate format, which is just JSON as a string. And since strings can be handled automatically by the library, which is send, uh, that's quite easy to work with. So. But you can have Serda, you can, don't have to use Serda JSON. You can have it create, uh, I think you can do YAML. There are a lot of other formats that support it. So if you want that instead, you can do that. But JSON is quite, it's quite easy to work with and you can be pretty sure that every language uh, has support for it. And then it's also important to think that your clients or your servers can be Android phones. It can be really anything. And uh, if you have some grand idea on how to distribute computations, like if you have yeah, you can you can just think about the possibilities and uh, see if you can create something cool. And then uh, you might want to look out for a pub sub example as well. But for now, uh, this is just the basic introduction in Rust. Thank you.